Welcome to the Merle End. I'm Dominic Machado, and today I am joined by award-winning uh, Sri Lankan cricket historian Nick Brooks and everybody's favorite Sri Lankan sports journalist Estelle Vasudevan. It is eight days since the women won the Asia Cup. That's our new uh, way of measuring time here at the Merle End. Uh, but today we're not going to be talking about the women's team. We'll hold that for later this week when we talk about the upcoming tour to Ireland and prospects for the World Cup. Today we're going to be talking about Sri Lanka's unlikely undefeated run against India in ODIs. We can't call it a um, winning run because they had a tie in the first game that really shouldn't have been a tie. Um Estelle, it seemed like um, in the first match, there wasn't a ton of energy around the team. But how quickly fortunes turned for that second match when we had a packed house um, in Colombo. What is the energy like on the ground in Sri Lanka? Yeah, unfortunately, I haven't been to any of the games yet. But like you said, following that T20 disaster, <laughs> um you know, the feeling wasn't that great in Sri Lanka. I think they got a few boos in the grounds as well. Hmm. But during the last game, you could distinctly hear the chance of Sri Lanka, Sri Lanka back, right? And I think that's great to hear. You saw guys like Pandasay talking about the support um, that comes from the crowd and how they need it. I think it's also a very timely reminder to players uh, about how fickle the fan bases can be. Mm. And that it's important not to, you know, um, yes, support is great. And, you know, fans make the game, right? Fans are the reason the game is what it is today. But also not to kind of uh, measure yourself or value yourself based on the reaction of fans because things can turn yeah. so fast, right? This is literally a matter of days where you went, they went from booing the team uh, to, you know, cheering them. Um, but anyway, I think it's it's actually a massive achievement, isn't it? Because mm. Sri Lanka haven't beaten India in an ODI for a while, haven't um, haven't avoided loss in what what is it since ninety seven? Yeah, yeah. That's it's it's been a very long time, and I think you know, especially given the kind of scars from the last two times we had played India and ODIs and getting bundled out for, you know, 55 and 50. And I think there was another game in the last year where we were skittled out for under 100. Mm -hmm. um, so it really is kind of uh, surprising and, and, and momentous. And we'll get into kind of the details of the game in a minute. But Nick, as the, you know, resident Sri Lanka cricket historian, where do you rank this in the unlikelies, the, the very, very many unlikely things that have happened in Sri Lanka cricket, right? We go from completely um, fumbling a T20 series, which we thought, okay, maybe it'll be competitive, to taking on a nearly full-strength uh, Indian ODI squad. I mean, it's the wildest week I can remember in Sri Lankan cricket in a long time. And I think that's saying something, right? You know, just a week ago... I was sitting there watching the 19th and 20th overs of that T20 bowled by Rinku Singh and Sky seeing, I mean, wickets full left, right and center I, and like feeling like I was trapped in a nightmare. And then, I mean, it comes to the first ODI on Friday and the narrative completely flips, right? I mean, it felt like on Tuesday, Sri Lanka conspired to lose a game that they had wrapped up. And then on Friday, they somehow tie a game that they just had no right to be in, right? I thought that they batted not particularly well, uh, gave away lots of soft dismissals in the first inning, in the first ODI and the second ODI, which I feel like when you're playing a team who are better than you, especially on a bad pitch, is something that you don't really get away with that often. I mean, from the first over, Akshar Patel bowled in that first ODI, you just felt that this pitch was going to be uh, an absolute treasure trove for spinners. It wasn't just the turn, but that raging bounce, right? Balls just leaping off the pitch. Um, and yes, somehow they managed to tie that game. I mean, when Rohit Sharma were bat was batting and then when Kohli and Shreyas were building a partnership, I just felt like it was really getting away from Sri Lanka. They hung around. What a dramatic finish with Sharath picking up those last two wickets when, in, when Dubey seemed to have got them over the line. And then again yesterday, I mean, it just 
crazy again at like at 97 for none you think this game's done and dusted and then Jeffrey van der See back from the dead comes and picks up six wickets in no time I mean yeah. it's been one for the one for the resurrections right with Aquila and van der See <laughs> uh but I mean I think we've got to reflect on the fact that these are very uncharacteristic pitches for ODI cricket um that uh, definitely the pitches have played a part. It's interesting to see the on-raging turners, the gap between two sides, which has seemed quite vast over the past 18 months, um, has diminished considerably. Uh, but, I mean, I think there's blessings and curses to be taken from it, and I hope that Sri Lanka don't get into the habit of playing all their ODIs um, at home on absolute raging turners and minefields because i mean they're going to go away and they're going to come up against pitches that are very different to this uh but yeah i mean at the moment i'm just loving it i've enjoyed a week full of crazy cricket um and yeah i feel like it's probably taken 10 years off my life but um maybe they've been worth it yeah this uh these throwback odi pitches right we feel like we're we're back in the late 90s back in the early 2000s where you know, 230 plays 230. We're talking about low scoring scrappers where, um, you know, even if you're reasonably well set at 97 for none, you can fall apart for just over 200, right? With a all time great batting lineup. I, I think yesterday, and this was kind of a weird flip of the third T20, India totally rejigged their batting lineup. I think KL Rahul came in at seven or something like that. And uh, Shreyas Iyer came in at six. So you're thinking, what, they can bat that deep that long, and then they can hardly, they can't score 241 runs. But Estelle, I want to kind of ask your opinion on what Nick said, right? Um, this is not how the one day game is being played anymore, right? It's not, this is not the type of pitch that we should expect basically anywhere else in the world, except maybe Bangladesh. Um, what do you take from Sri Lanka winning in very much, you know, sort of home conditions? Of course, India should fare well in conditions like this, too. But um, what do you take from it? And what do you think about the larger picture um, and what this means for the larger picture? Yeah, I think, first of all, the the preparation of the pitch, it's deliberate because uh, I think they've realized that that's the only way we can compete with a team like India. Um, giving them flat tracks is not going to work. And we saw that in, in Palakele, didn't we? So that's one thing. It's very short term thinking. Um, and I, I don't know. Look, I love the 90s throwback games, right? I love when it's a bit scrappy. Mm. It's not all, you know, bowlers getting bashed and all of that. I love it. But you also have to accept that that's not where the game is going right now. And it is going to be detrimental to your to, to, to teams that are getting accustomed to playing in those kind of conditions. Um, when they go overseas or when they go into big tournaments, they're not going to have those conditions, right? Unless like, there's like some, some catastrophe like we saw in the US where you, yeah. I mean, in New York where pitch, the pitch just was not, suitable for a tournament so in that way it's a bit it's a bit disappointing because if you look at i mean you look we saw the lpl particularly outside colombo the palakale dambula games lots of runs flat pitchers and we saw the same in the t20 series as well mm -hmm. um so that you feel like that's moving in the right direction it's giving your players an opportunity to play in conditions that um you are likely to see around the world right i would like to think and this is i'm sure this is like wishful thinking i would like to think this was just a ploy to get the boys a win get them some confidence and like bring them into that space where they understand that they can beat india because like you said two games of 50 all out i think it was 90 something all out before that when sri lanka yeah. toured um, india right at the beginning of 2023 so mm -hmm. I, I mean, wishful thinking, It I would say that maybe it was a ploy to get, get their confidence up a little bit because they it feels like now every time they go into a game against India, they have this monkey on their backs like, okay, Siraj is 
going to bowl us all out or you know what's going to happen as the moment one wicket goes you know there is a bit of uh, panic so <laughs> i hope uh, that is the reason why the pitches were uh, like that it's like i said it seems very short term thinking just wanting to aim at you know beating india in a bilateral that means nothing i mean in the past at least you had the odi super league and stuff like that where the games actually mattered but that's no longer the case so it it feels kind of uh pointless but at the same time a win is a win right and and yeah. if you if we talk about all the criticism this team has had and then we talk about sri lanka hasn't beaten no, india in a bilateral since 1997 that means all that i mean since 97 we've had some of our most successful teams right and they haven't managed to beat india so the coming game is of a huge opportunity um, for this sri lanka team which i'm sure no one would have i mean <laughs> at the beginning of the series no one no one would have been counting on that right yeah i i think that's that's i agree with that that I think that um it's a definite ploy to say all right let's make these games at least more competitive right uh, because we saw a gulf between the teams in the T20s and then we play for longer that gulf is going to get bigger so there was definitely some you know at least I hope some thinking and to some extent um I I'm in two minds about it obviously Sanat is an interim coach right so I kind of feel like it's not i would feel a little bit differently if we had just appointed a new coach and this was the first thing that the new coach had, had done right uh, also a new captain in charas asalanka and having to adapt to getting you know hided by india isn't really a good way to to sort of welcome him to the test cap to to the white ball captaincy i'm sorry yeah um so i i feel like that makes sense and it's good to give them that confidence um at the same time you know you look at the way that they are playing and you think this there's no way this is replicable replicable anywhere mm -hmm. else in the world right one seam bowler um you know three bowlers three real bowlers in total a handful of you know whatever type of spin you want um you know you've got kamindu you've got charith charith looking like you know a world class off spinner on these on these pitches that's just not something that's going to be replicable they had kamindu come in at 8 that's mm -hmm. something that's not going to be replicable um and it made me kind of think you know it's really going to be really important for whoever the new coach is to say okay we're not really playing important odis for another 4 years right till the world cup how do we build a squad that's going to be competitive in south africa cuz we sure as hell are not finding these going to find these pitches in south africa Um so I think okay to get the confidence up but at the same time it's a little bit of a I'm not sure it's a pyrrhic victory but it's a victory that has some conditions attached to it. Uh that being said, Nick, who impressed you in these last two games? Who are the players who have kind of stood out and um shown you something? Um lots of guys. I mean before I move on to that, just a little stat that I struck on yeah. today. I think Charit's bowling average now at the Premier League, so he's got I think I believe he's got 11 ODI wickets yeah. at an average of about 12 and elsewhere he's got none at an average of infinity, which <laughs> I mean gives you some insight. But I mean I think if you're looking at guys who've stood out, top of the list has to be Dunith Willalage, right? For yeah. the way he's batted, uh really impressive i mean in that first odi he really dragged sri lanka out of trouble and it was interesting because when he came to the crease he kind of looked like a walking wicket right i think mm. there were four or five of his first you know 10 balls where he there were appeals or shouts and he looked like he was going to get out every ball uh but he really ground it out and found a method he was sweeping a lot more than the other batters uh he showed a kind of power game which we haven't seen that much from him in the past uh and yeah just really really impressive um application i've always thought that he looks like a kind of natural batter with a good technique and i think maybe he's someone who we're going to see batting higher up in the mm -hmm. future uh i was really impressed with the way patham batted in the first odi and uh i um just the more you see of him the more and more complete he's looking as a white ball player right uh and i think you know the 
the future's so bright for him. But I was really impressed with the way Kamindu batted when he came in yesterday. Uh, Avishka looked good. It was a shame to see him kind of get out softly. I think there have been too many, too many yeah. soft dismissals. Really disappointing to see Charith sort of getting out carving the ball to slip twice um on the bowling side of things it's i find it tough to say because it's hard <laughs> to read too much into um bowlers when i mean when the ball is leaping and spitting so viciously uh but i mean you've got to say that a killer bowled great in that first um game i was it was funny because you're used to him kind of bowling all sorts and he had two left in front two left handers he was starting to look like a much more classical off spinner you know i was like yeah. is this the same guy uh and then van der bowled really well didn't he yesterday mixing in leg breaks and googlies and um it's funny because you know uh the turn and the bounce obviously gets so much into batters heads that a lot of the time then it's the balls that don't do that much mm. that end up taking wickets uh and i mean actually before i round off i should say you know been, got to been really really impressed with the way sri lanka fielded uh that slip catch by Kamindu oh yesterday. I mean, what a blinder. That was a standout. But I think in general, their application in the field uh, has been really, really good, really impressive. I wonder if that's something that Sanath has um, sort of focused on coming in. Uh, and I mean, the one, I think, slight disappointment for me is to see Mahesh Dikshana sitting on the bench. Uh, I understand that this is a pitch that probably favours spinners who give the ball a bit more flight and bowl slightly slower. Uh, but we talk about building towards South Africa in 2026, and I see him as a guy who Sri Lanka should be building around as a cornerstone for both of their white ball teams. And, you know, I wondered if on these pitches it was the kind of situation where you could have given him the new ball and he bowls in the power play. And, you know, um, yeah. with the way that he can mix in caroms and off breaks and straight ones with a pitch that's receptive, yeah. I felt like he could still be dangerous. So I wonder whether we'll see him in the third ODI. I suspect that we won't. Uh, and I hope that that's not a trend moving forward. Yeah. Some, some points that I want to kind of uh, come back to. Uh, Dunith Walalage, right, and, and his performance and the way he batted. And Nick mentioned moving him up the order. Estelle, do you feel like, and I know there's some debate around this, that he should be moved up the order? I guess the, the argument that he shouldn't is that, okay, he's comfortable, he's scoring runs there. You're now putting him under pressure by moving him up to, say, three or four or something like that. Um, do you have any thoughts on where Walalage should play or where he should bat, rather? Yeah, he, I mean, every opportunity he's got, he's made the most of, right? We've seen that right throughout. Yeah. He hasn't got extended opportunities, but whenever he's got the opportunity to bat, he's, he's done well. My only concern would be, I don't see a particular role he fits into in terms of looking at, looking forward to where the game is going. He is very good on in conditions like this, right? where you need to pull out those sweeps, you need to use your feet, nerdle things around. He's very good in conditions like that. But is he going to be as successful on flatter pitches? That'll be, I think, the question. And like I said, if Sri Lanka want to succeed, they're going to have to build towards that. So where does he fit then in that middle order? Because uh, you're not moving probably the top three, right? Yeah. And then you've got uh, Charit at five who isn't moving either so do you push him to four um, or do you play him at six I think he's actually really handy number eight uh, with one Duda coming at number seven where you you are kind of prepared if there's a catastrophe but you don't have to depend on him as a batter to come in and you know uh, make the big runs particularly on batting friendly wickets I think Sri Lanka can also look to be honest to kind of go with a horses for courses type of approach yeah. with uh, our lineups because you've got guys like Dunit who would be really good in conditions like this, uh, similar to uh, what Nick was talking about when it comes to Mahesh, right? Mm -hmm. It's funny actually to me that I was just thinking while Nick was saying that, that maybe they wanted to leave him out knowing that you know he, he it's a given that he's going to be in your playing 11 when the important games come along and they want to just kind of rotate who who is your second bowling lineup and then i remembered that akila and 
<laughs> Bandersa are both significantly older than yeah. uh, Thikshan, right? So uh, it's very interesting to me that both of them have come back because I would, I mean. I was one of the people who wondered why they would bring Van der Sey back now uh, when you have someone like Vyas Kant who you could mm. pro- possibly, you know, build towards the future and get him, getting him to play an inconsequential series like this would be actually great because, you know, maybe you're looking at him at for the next T20 World Cup. Yeah. But Van der Sey, I mean, obviously he's, he, he was great yesterday. Uh, to be honest, he hasn't been bad whenever he's got yeah. opportunities, but like he himself said, it's just that Manindu is the best leg spinner in the country, right? So um, it's difficult for him to fit in. I, I kind of feel for him because when he should have been backed, he didn't get that backing. Yeah. And now it feels like, I mean, I don't know, he might play until he's 40, but like it feels like it's a bit too late for him to really build on, you know, build a career, um, and become one of the better spinners that Sri Lanka have produced. It's funny when you think about um, the absence of Van der Sey, you know, six, seven years ago, and you think, who are they bowling? You know, they were bowling Devin Mendes mm-hmm. uh, and guys like that. Instead of, again, right, we're talking about short-term thinking versus long-term thinking, right? And Van der Sey would have been a good investment. I'm glad to see him do well because he's done well in, in matches before. And obviously, like, he has this beautiful flight and dip but I think Viascant is someone well worth investing in he you know he's a tall leg spinner and he gets that good balance he bowls good lines he good bowls with good pace um, and I do hope that they give him a run especially if um, Hasaranga is hurt and I don't know know how long he's going to be out for um, on the matter of Duneth I think the question is how is he going how would he do you know, in a in a wicket where it seems and swings, mm-hmm. right? Like he has to come in early and face seam and, you know, some serious pace. He may have improved on that, but I think last time um, I saw him do that, he really he really did struggle. I think it was against Australia, if I remember correctly. And Pat Cummins kind of uh, worked him over, un, you know, unsurprisingly. But um, again, a great talent, incredible fighter. I wanted to pick back up on Nick's point about the fielding. This is a much younger team, mm-hmm. I think. 29 is pretty much the oldest that you got. So everyone is pretty lively and active in the field. So it's really good to see a Sri Lankan side um, do that. Um, Two other things I wanted to check in on. So um, talking about mentality and building for the long term, I thought it was really interesting what Rohit Sharma told uh, Roshan Abhisinga um, the other day. So I think Roshan asked him, you know, you were on 65 why do you play that shot to get out? And I'll he asked read... him whether he was disappointed, disappointed to get out yeah. that way. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And, you know, should you be disappointed? And he says, uh, the reason I got 65 runs is because of the way I batted. When I bat like that, there is bound to be risk taking and I'm not afraid to do it. Whenever you get out, whether you score 150 or zero, you feel disappointed if you don't get across that line. But that won't change my intent. We didn't play uh, good cricket. That's why we lost the game. Um, and I think that that is a really telling example of the difference in mentality between Sri Lankan batters and Indian batters and why Indian batters are the best in the world. Um, Nick, what would you, what do you think it would take for Sri Lankan batters to be able to internalize that kind of logic that this is the way I play? When I score runs, it's because I play aggressively. And sometimes it's not going to come off, and that's okay. Yeah, it's a really tricky one. I mean, I've seen it with English cricket, right? We had it for years uh, in England where the ODI team was miles behind the curve and players would get pilloried for playing bad shots and getting out. And it held England's cricket back. And then we saw Trevor Bayliss come in and Owen Morgan come in as captain, and they embraced this, you play your game, you get out, no one's going to have a go at you. And I mean, we saw how much they grew from like 2015 to 2019 when they became ODI uh, World Cup champions. I mean, I think in Sri Lanka, it's difficult because you've got this public factor as well, right? Where people are worried about what fans are going to say and what fans are going to think. And I mean, if anyone can introduce that kind of mentality, I would say that Sanath is the best person, right? And I mean, I think we're starting to see signs of it. Uh, 
it's difficult because you want players to attack and to play their shots, but you also want them to be judicious in their shot selection, yeah. right? And so, I mean, for example, in the first ODI, I see the Fernando playing across the line really early when the ball's kind of moving around. Sorry, Avishka Fernando. Um, doesn't necessarily seem that sensible, yeah. but at the same time, if that if he thinks that's productive, there's a gap at mid-wicket. Uh, I can understand it. Uh, I think Liana Gay, where the way he was caught and bowled, you know, didn't quite get one, but you can see what he's trying to do. Um, it's tough, but yeah, I think that players have to realise that when you play attacking cricket, you're going to get out in ways that look unedifying or ugly from time to time, and that that's just part of the modern game. And as much as players have to realise it, I think fans have to realise it too. And you can't have your cake and eat it. You can't expect mm-hmm. guys to be looking to score 320, 350. And then every time someone, you know, knocks one up in the air, um, criticise them as being an yeah. idiot for playing a stupid shot. Yeah, yeah. I was that. I was exactly thinking of that. Is right? Like, a, you know, Sri Lankan fans, every dismissal is, you know, sort of analyzed and overanalyzed. Oh, what an idiot for playing that shot. And of course, you know, if you played any professional or not any professional sport, but if you played any sport, you know that risk brings reward. You're never going to get, you know, you're never going to get far by taking the conservative approach. You're never going to score 350 just by taking zero risks. That's just not something that happens. Estelle, um, I think here is actually a really interesting comparison with the women's squad where you saw someone like um, Harshita and Kavisha, right? We don't think of them as players who are, I mean, Kavisha more so than Harshita, but they don't have high career strike rates. Yet in the big moment, they had the confidence. And again, Rumesh Ratnayak has been preaching this, the fearlessness to, um, to do it. And, Maybe, you know, since you've covered both teams so closely, it, what do you think, what are the, the attitudes that are driving that difference? Or what are the circumstances that are driving that difference? To be honest, when we, you, we compare ourselves to India, right? I see two things. First of all, Indian players do get criticized for playing shots like that and getting dismissed, right? But I think within the squad, they trust the process. The process. And they trust that they are working towards something bigger than it is. I mean, I remember when Rahul Dravid took over, there was so much criticism, right? For the Mm -hmm. way he was doing things, who he was picking, uh, the way Rohit Sharma was playing, right? This is like a, almost a reborn Rohit Sharma from a guy who we saw in the, you know, 2013s, 12s, that time, right? He's a very different player uh, from then. I mean, he may not be getting as many centuries, but he's playing, I mean, during, even during the 2023 World Cup, right? He was outstanding in the way he set that standard of going hard, no matter what, right? They do get criticized, but they have that environment where they're, they're repeatedly given that confidence that we are working towards a bigger goal. You might fail today, but this is building towards something else. Mm-hmm. I think that's a similar thing we can talk about about the women as well, right, right now, where that's the messaging we are getting as media from them is that we talk about positive things. We want to go out there and play positive cricket. We are not told to fear that, okay, if you get out, what's going to happen? Mm. You're taught to go out and play that game, but play the game. And I think a lot of that comes down to the fact that there isn't a lot of attention on the women's team. Mm. And there isn't as much as like the toxic kind of attention, right? That might change in the in the future. But with the men, I mean, you take a simple example, like you take a Kusal Mendes, right? The amount of criticism he gets for playing certain shots. When that is what has brought him success over the last couple of years. If you look at his record in the last two years, in T20 cricket especially, he's been one of the top openers in the world, right? That is because of the way he's he's kind of turned his game around. The success we saw in the World Cup where Sri Lanka were chasing 400 in those first couple of games, that is because of that aggressive intent that he was showing. Um, but when you constantly criticise it, and we've seen how not just the players, but even the management yeah. seems to be swayed by public opinion. Then that's where there's a huge problem, right? That's that's one thing. 
secondly i think it's also a skill issue right rohit sharma has a skill <laughs> to yeah do that consistently um whereas that may not be the case for some of the sri lankan players so it it's many things i think mentality wise i think it certainly affects them that you know the moment there is a huge public outcry about you know the way certain player plays he is told to change things around i mean the earrings and the haircuts and all that nonsense right like um so so those are th- i don't know whether you can change that whether whether there's going to be someone who is strong enough to say look we can't let the outside noise in we yeah. have to have a vision we have to be certain about what we want and go towards that um and if we fail we fail right we played the way we planned to play so i don't know if that will change but that's having mm-hmm. covered both teams that's something i see yeah i think that's 100% correct i think you know um maybe sri lankan fans would say if virat kohli didn't have tattoos and and didn't take care of his hair he'd have 70 hundreds you know when he'd be averaging 70 or 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 something like that but yeah i i think the skill differential is important um i saw people saying well why aren't sri lankans going over after the power play uh like you know rohit sharma does because they're not rohit sharma rohit sharma is one of the five greatest you know opening batters in one day cricket he is a tremendously talented. He's ultra experienced. He knows exactly when to push the levers. Shubman Gill, who is who is absolutely extremely talented, is playing completely differently. He is playing much more conservatively, and I, I think uh, people need to remember that. And also, they need to remember who's bowling. Mohammad Siraj and Archdeep Singh have been bowling pretty tight lines and bowling pretty well in this series. They haven't been getting the rewards, but. They're much better than us at the Fernando. And then, you know, whoever we happen to, you know, because Mohamed Shiraz got his debut. Ooh, and then the spinners were bowling in, in uh, the power play overs, which gives you opportunities, again, to be aggressive and to play the ball in the air. Right. So instead of reading the situation and saying, yeah, it is a very different thing. And and I understand why Sri Lankan management might say, hey, Kasal, you've been in the first over the last three matches. Don't go hell for leather and attack. Just absorb the pressure and, um, you know, bat out for a bit. And I think it's, I think that has to be weighed in, right? Like Sharma can do that because he's played 250 games of ODI cricket. He's seen everything that there is to see. He knows his game in and out and he's been authorized to play that way. We change, right? We, we, our styles change, our players change. I think one player who I've, who Nick mentioned has been really impressive has been Patham Nisanka because he has played with that clarity of mind, right? Balls in my slot, I'm going to smash it. Doesn't matter if I hit a leading edge to third man or if I hit it for four, that's how I'm going to play. But I think Nisanka, right? And then that's the other part. People see Nisanka and say, well, he developed. Why can't these other idiots develop, right? Um, He's the exception, not the rule, right? And we have to think about how do we put in the, you know, sort of the circumstances around them. And and we're batting people out of position too, which makes it harder. Even Charis at five is, you know, I think we've talked about this on this pod. He probably, like in a, in a, in a, uh, in some other teams, he'd be batting at a different position, right? But we have a glut of top order batters and he has a good skill set for a number five position and he's been productive, right? But, sometimes he doesn't feel comfortable hitting out against the pace bowlers, right? Or sometimes he has a bad spin matchup that he has to get to. So we have to realize that there are limitations on our players. And yes, they are talented and they can be much, much better than they have been. But that requires careful construction and careful thought. Um, And I hope the, the sort of temporary success they've had doesn't sweep them up and say, okay, let's just play a bunch of spinners and, and play cricket from 20 years ago um, because that that's not how things are going to work. Um, last question, and then I think we'll we'll wrap it up for today. First thoughts on Charis captaincy. So Estelle, I'll come to you first. Any initial thoughts on Charis captaincy so far? It's a funny, funny thing because when a team's doing well, mm. you automatically you know, you feel like he's doing a good job, right? With his bowling changes and, you know, the way he's maneuvered the field and all of that. So it's a difficult one to judge 
at the moment i would say like it, it's tough to make a judgment right now because we've seen so little of it um but i do hope and we've said this before right i do hope that they're patient with him because he's been a, like unlike one in the he's been a guy who they've kind of groomed for this right since the age group levels it's always been that you know one day charita salanka is going to captain sri lanka so i hope they're patient with him i hope um he's given the freedom to kind of experiment a little bit because uh, you know we have a t20 world cup coming up but in the 50 over yeah. format we have four years to really come together as a team right so i hope he's given that kind of freedom but i also hope that while he's given the freedom to choose players that he wants etc there's also a huge amount of uh, influence coming from the coach and the selectors because like you saw with hasaranga things can go south really fast when you say i want this particular player and then you come bust at a tournament right so i hope that you know that that kind of support is given to him my i mean he the only thing i'm a bit skeptical about is because at at the at the lpl he, his captaincy didn't seem great no, uh, no. but jaffna ended up winning right so sure. um it's very easy to kind of say that you know his captaincy was good when the team is successful so we, i guess we'll have to wait a bit and see how things go in the coming series nick uh yeah i mean i think the jury's still out and we haven't seen a lot uh, one thing I would say, and I guess this is a kind of negative and a positive wrapped into one, we presume that they've come into this series asking for rank turners, right? So I didn't necessarily understand picking Shiraz for the first ODI and equally winning the toss and batting first. I would have thought that it would have made sense to bowl first and to stack the team with spinners. But then it was great to see that they kind of... Um, were nimble thinking enough to pivot on that and they didn't continue with two seamers and they brought in Kamindu who not only strengthens the batting but enables you to get you know some easy overs because you don't have to be a world-class spinner on these Premadasa pitches to take uh, wickets or to do well. Uh, I mean in terms of kind of selection I was a little bit disappointed that Avishka didn't get to play in the T20s because he was riding such a confidence wave mm -hmm. from the LPL. And then, you know, you sit out for a week on the sidelines and some of that kind of dissipates a little bit. So, and again, I mean, I'm, as I mentioned with the Theeks thing earlier, so I've got some slight questions in terms of selection. I'd say it's questions rather than criticisms. In terms of bowling changes, I uh, haven't seen anything or field settings. I haven't seen anything that's upset me. Uh, I thought in the first ODI, it was wise the way they sent Will Allegay in instead of Hasaranga, in front of Hasaranga when Sri mm. Lanka needed to rebuild. And they've rebuilt really successfully, right? You know, in both ODIs, I think they were like 130, 140 for six. Uh, positions where you sometimes think like, oh shit, we could be heading towards 170 all out here. And that hasn't happened. They've identified that 230 on this wicket is a good score and they've got up to 230, 240 both times. So yeah, I mean, I think we've got to give Charith a much longer leash and a lot more time to see where things go. I don't think the, yeah, I don't think we could read too much into what we've seen so far. One thing I would say though, which isn't a reflection on Charith's captaincy at all but it's a broader point which just struck me as interesting is we've seen three bowlers now in this series in Shiraz, um, Akila and Van der See, who hardly played in the LPL at all mm. right which just strikes me as strange and I mean I think it's another suggestion that five teams is too few and that you know we need more teams in the LPL and that if you've got guys who are big enough who are good enough to be considered to be in the international pool, the pool of national players, then they have to be playing in your franchise tournament, right? And so I would really like to see the LPL expand. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not just those guys. We saw, you know, young guys, someone like Chris Pelé, who was young player of the tournament mm -hmm. last year, not play at all this year. And it's, um, yeah, I think, so I think I would like to see the LPL expand to six teams and beyond so that we can get all the guys mm -hmm. who are in national consideration playing in the league. Yeah. Yeah, that's a, a lot of really good points there. I agree. We've got to give Charith a long leash, right? He's um, he's young. 
I think he's still got a lot to learn tactically and strategically. You can tell he's been brought up as a captain in Sri Lanka just because of the way he reacts. Like he feels much more comfortable in these past two ODIs than he did in the T20s, right? You can see he's like, okay, slow turning pitch. This is how we should operate. This is the type of team that we should pick for that. But when it comes to, all right, how do we rotate bowlers when 220 is the par score? Um, that's a harder thing to kind of figure out. So kind of two things to look for is one, I'm really hoping that he gets some franchise time um, in the near future, because I think being exposed to other people's ways of thinking about cricket, how they approach the game will be really, really good for him because I think he's a smart guy. I think he's a quick learner. It seems like there's good camaraderie in the team, right? Uh, One thing I was impressed by was the team showed up to play these two games after getting smashed in the T20 series, right? There was no lack of energy. And I think um, often Sri Lankan fans are quick to critique The team is not playing with heart, not trying their hardest. But I think they're out there giving everything they got to try to win these games. Um, And the other thing that I wanted to mention is I think aggressiveness is something that Asalanka could amp up a little bit. I think, who was it? It was either Rohit Sharma or Shubman Gill, third or fourth over in the chase, the first game. Nick's straight to second slip, but there's no second slip in. Um, you know, when you're defending 200, 230, restricting runs is never going to win you matches. It's it's the wickets that are going to win you matches. So being aware of that, there were a couple of times where I thought maybe having a leg slip or having someone in short to prevent the easy singles could have been helpful. Um, when there was a new batter in, instead of squeezing them, they were they they sometimes took the pressure. Those are all small things, and I think those are things that can be learned you know, on the fly as the game develops and as you get more confident in your team and who's going to play. Again, it's interesting to see probably the balance of power between someone like Charith and Sanath, because I would definitely imagine there's a lot of deference from Charith to Sanath in terms of team selection. So uh, whoever becomes full-time coach, it will be interesting to see what that relationship looks like between Charith and them. Okay. One last question to to um, wrap it up. I thought we were going to end there, but but the question popped in as I was as I was speaking. If Sri Lanka win the next match and defeat India, what are the chances that Sanath moves from an interim head coach to a full time head coach? So, Nick, I'll start with you on this one. Yeah, I mean, I always felt that. Sanath's appointment as an interim coach was a trial run and that if he did well enough, the gig would be offered to him long term. And I mean, look, the best series performance against India in a quarter of a century since he was pretty much captain. Uh, he became captain in 99, right? So, yeah, I mean, it's a hell of a statement. It's a hell of a headline. And I think that if they follow that up with a decent showing in in, in England, which I mean, again, you know, I think the wide expectation is that Sri Lanka will probably lose this series 3-0 um, as West Indies have just done. So, I mean, if they're able to draw a game or win a game, then you're starting to certainly be able to build a really cohesive narrative as to why Sanath should stay on. And so, I mean, I think that he is probably thinking like that, that, you know, he's a couple of results away now, a couple of decent performances away from being offered that gig long term. Estelle? Um, I'm not actually sure because I feel like I'm not sure whether he wants to to do it long term because he obviously understands what a what a responsibility it is, right? And it's not an easy job uh, because what I recall from the pre series press conference was that he kept emphasizing that he's just an interim coach. Uh, so I wonder whether he is actually interested in taking it on long term. I mean, if he's able to produce the results, then I don't see why not. But I'm still, I'm still kind of on the fence on on Sanat Jayasuri, the coach. Yeah, I I kind of uh, am of the same opinion as Estelle. I don't get the sense that he wants it, but you know, the thing that makes me skeptical is he did travel with the team to the United States to oversee mm-hmm. the T Twenty World Cup. Um, so we'll see, we'll see what happens. Um, we will come back 
at the end of the week to talk about the exciting things coming up, the upcoming Ireland series. The women's team travel to Ireland in the next couple of weeks. Chomri, of course, will be sitting that one out to play in the 100. Um, and then the men have their test tour to England. This has been the Murley End. If you've been listening and you've been listening for all 45 minutes thus far, give us a like, subscribe to us on whatever platform you're listening to us. Um, if it's on Facebook, give us a follow too. All right. Thank you. Bye.